Good evening and welcome to Alt 24 News, streaming live from Algiers. With me, I'm Abdurrahim Kashour and to the headlines. Novak Djokovic, tennis star, deported after losing Australia visa battle. Serbian tennis star says he was extremely disappointed for the decision. An underwater volcano in the South Pacific erupted violently on Saturday, causing tsunami to hit Hawaii, Japan and Tongal's largest island, sending waves flooding into the capital. Law enforcement rescued the rabbi and other people who were being held hostage at Dana's area synagogue on Saturday night and in an hours-long standoff as the suspect was confirmed dead. In Bangladesh, 63 people have died from COVID-19 in 24 hours, according to press release issued by the Director General of Health Services. A total number of deaths in the country has reached 13,345, and the death rate stands at 100, or let me say 1.59%. Hello again and welcome. Those were today's headlines. U.S. Algeria Business Council hosted the 2021 U.S. Agriculture Roadshow to Algeria for U.S. companies and U.S. farmers seeking opportunities in the agriculture sector in Algeria. Through site visits, introduction to key decision makers in the Algeria government and business-to-business -business meetings, the roadshow will give U.S. executive an edge in the trade between Algeria and the United States of America. The 2021 U.S. Agriculture Roadshow to Algeria is a unique occasion for the Algerian companies and Algerian farmers to learn about U.S. expertise in the agriculture sector and to meet with the workable U.S. partners. We've done a lot of American farmers, a lot of American technology, and we're excited to come to Algeria to meet other farmers who are interested in uh, growing crops, expanding their businesses, and meeting a lot of the local politicians. Um, this group is excited coming from the United States, I must say. In particular, uh, we're looking to find partners who want to grow large amounts of crops and, and do fertilizer projects uh, and really expand their operations. Um, we bring a lot of American farmers with us. We're happy as the, the first day we just arrived here. Most of the, uh, of course, the delegation came all the way from the U.S some of them from California, some from Utah, and uh, happy to be here and came to Algiers first and then we just landed here in Oran. I think this is a, a large delegation that definitely coming here to do business in Algeria. Coming to Australia now, world number one Novak Djokovic left the country after losing his final bid to avoid deportation and playing the Australian Open despite being unvaccinated for COVID-19. A 34 years old from Serbia said he was extremely disappointed by the ruling but respected. A mask Djokovic was photographed in Melbourne airport along with two government officials in black uniforms. How are you feeling, Mr. Djokovic? Tonga's massive volcanic eruption prompted tsunami waves across the Pacific, causing serious damage to the island nation's capital. Prime Minister of New Zealand stated that Tonga's capital was damaged by Saturday's volcanic explosion, although there was no reports of death so far. Maybe on what follow. Saturday's Tonga volcano explosion was so powerful, it prompted a tsunami across the island and flooded Pacific coastlines from Japan to the United States. According to New Zealand Prime Minister Dakinda Arden, the capital Nukualofa suffered significant damage. Communication with Tonga remains very limited, and I know that is causing a huge amount of anxiety for the Tongan community here who are trying to get hold of loved ones back home. 
The main undersea communications cable has been impacted, likely due to the loss of power. Official damage assessments are not yet available. However, our High Commission in Tonga advised the tsunami has had a significant impact on the foreshore on the northern side of Nuku'alofa, with boats and large boulders washed ashore. The tsunami forced residents to move to higher ground as waves swept the capital, leaving them without power and flooding their houses causing some damage. Still alive or are they safe? Um, because there's just no way of um, getting in contact with our loved ones. So far we haven't been able to contact our family at all. The country's defence force tweeted eyesight. New Zealand will send an Air Force reconnaissance aircraft as soon as atmospheric conditions allow. U.S. Secretary of State Antony Blinken expressed concern for the people of Tonga and pledged for support to the inhabitants of the island. The explosion was so powerful that it was heard in Alaska and the tsunami caused flooding in Santa Cruz, California. To avoid calamities, Peru blocked 22 of its ports. According to Marco Brenna, a senior lecturer at Otago University's School of Geology, the impact of the eruption was quite moderate, but another eruption with a considerably larger impact could not be excluded. Two women drowned in Peru after being swept away by anomalous waves on beach on the Pacific coast. Peruvian authorities are now on Saturday linking the event on the volcanic eruption in Tonga on another beach. Waves swamped restaurants near the sea more than 10 hours after the tsunami hit Tonga. The FBI stormed a synagogue in the U.S. state of Texas hours after the man took four people captive during a live stream Shabbat service. Officials tell the AP hostage taker them demanded the release of Afif Siddiqui, a Pakistani neuroscientist who was convicted of trying to kill U.S. soldiers in Afghanistan. All four hostages have been released, unarmed, and the capture pronounced dead more than 10 hours after they disrupted a religious service and began a chance stand of with people, or let me say with police. Sometime around 9 p.m. today, uh, this evening, the HRT, the hostage rescue team, breached uh, the, um, the synagogue. Uh, they rescued the three hostages and uh, the, the subject is deceased. Uh, the, sh the hostage taker is deceased. Uh, we will conduct an independent investigation. My evidence response team will be here to process the scene, and a team from Washington will be here to conduct an independent investigation of the shooting incident, uh, and, and that's the way we handle those things uh, through our normal uh, standard operating procedure. John Joel Joseph, a suspect in the murder of Haiti President Giovanni Muiz, has been arrested according to Jamaican police. Former Haitian senator was arrested by Jamaican authorities for Haitian assassination in July. Jamaica Police Supervisor Stephen Lindsay told the Associated Press News Agency that other people were also arrested along with Joseph and the authorities were trying to determine whether they were family members. Bangladesh has enforced a new set of rules and guidelines to check a sharp rise in COVID-19 infections in the past week to the South Asian country reported 3 points. 359 new cases and 12 COVID-related deaths on Thursday with a positivity rate of 12%. The Chinese capital Beijing detected the first Omicron variant case just a week before it is due to host the Winter Olympic Games. Since the positive case was identified, more than 2,500 people in the area have been tested. Officials held a meeting in which they emphasize they need to work on finding the origin of the infection in order to first fight its separate. Peru hospitals are near collapse as the South American nation is experiencing a third wave of infection. The new COVID-19 and macro variants and the predominant Delta infections are filing hospitals, beds, and intensive an intensive care unit to capacity. The number of citizens infected with COVID-19 rose to 2,562,534 and the death to 
uh, reached 203,376 in Peru as of January 14th. According to the last update from the Ministry of Health, Mensa, within the framework, 29 people passed away from the virus on the analyzed day. And it must be noted that now over 2 million people have been discharged and cleared healthy. Over and other 5,542 were hospitalized in two days latest. COVID around the world is still spreading and the latest over the statistics in the support by Usamayadi. After it started delivering vaccine doses to poor countries in February 2021, the global vaccine sharing program COVAX has reached its target of shipping 1 billion doses to 144 countries. In Austria, thousands of protesters took to the streets of the capital Vienna to protest against government plans to introduce mandatory COVID-19 vaccinations for next month. Peru's health minister Hernando Cavallos has called on COVID-19 vaccine companies to extend expiration dates past the current three months to reduce the risk of losing doses. Protesters have taken to the streets and cities across France to reject a law that would see the implementation of tighter restrictions on people not vaccinated against COVID-19, as Parliament continues to debate the draft bill. According to Beijing Winter Olympic Organization Committee, transmissibility of the Omicron variant is a cause for serious problems for Olympic athletes, despite the coronavirus containment measures undertaken. Prince Andrew, let me say, Andrew's attorney said in a filing with the New York courts that they were seeking testimony from Judith Lightfoot, with her psychologist in her adopted home of Australia. Loyal Melissa Lernan said that the prince's legal team want to quiz Lightfoot about what was discussed during her counseling sessions with Wiffer, who says she was trafficked to Andrew for sex in 2001. The prince's lawyer argued that Wiffer may suffer from false memories and want to ask Lightfoot about the theory of false memories, the letter said. The latest report on Downing Street party scandals revealed that Boris Johnson held wine time Fridays every week during the COVID pandemic. Boris Johnson encouraged number 10 staff to let off steam during the weekly alcoholic induced rites, despite restrictions such as indoor socializing being strictly banned at the time. Zara for January, let's follow. British Prime Minister Boris Johnson faced new calls to quit after he and his wife attended a party with Downing Street staff in May 2020 during lockdown when the public were barred from seeing more than one person in an outdoor setting. Johnson apologized for attending the party, which he said he thought was a work meeting, although rules in the UK at the time said households could meet with one other person in outdoor settings. Mr Speaker, I want to apologize. I know that millions of people across this country have made extraordinary sacrifices over the last 18 months. And I know the rage they feel with me and with the government I lead when they think that in Downing Street itself the rules are not being properly followed by the people who make the rules. In a speech to the Fabian Society conference, British Labour leader puts pressure on Boris Johnson as the latter fights to save his job. This self-indulgent Tory party is having a fight about a leader who they should have known from the start is not fit for office. But we've got other massive challenges facing this country, massive challenges. We've got a prime minister who is absent, you know, he's literally in hiding at the moment um, and unable to lead. And so um, that's why I've concluded that um, he's got to go. A group of Boris Johnson's lookalike staged a protest calling My Name is Boris and this is a work event. People in London called for Prime Minister Boris Johnson to step down after he apologised in Parliament for attending the drinks gathering in his Downing Street office during lockdown. I think it's, it's absolutely disgusting that somebody who is supposed to be a leader leads by breaking their own rules. If it's true, and it's debatable, but I think 
the probabilities that it was true, um, I think it was wrong. Johnson's ruling Conservative Party holds a majority in the UK Parliament, but after a mass of scandals, some lawmakers may have begun to lose faith in the Prime Minister's authority to lead the country. To a different matter now, Sudan completed another week in the dark on just how to form a government accepted by civilian groups. Aimed at violence and death in the capital Khartoum and why the protests have been all against the junta, it turns out division with the civilians movement could also be hurting any steps toward a lasting solution. A senior police officer was shot dead in the battle with protesters opposed to military regime. Until now, the situation is worsening day by day with no spotlight forward. Yes, officials are rising alarm that Russian threats of war against Ukraine are spiking dangerously despite the conclusion of a week of diplomatic meetings aimed at avoiding the outbreak of the open conflict. National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan warned Thursday that Russia is preparing a false flag operation to use a pretext to launch an offensive against Kiev on top of its buildup of more than 1,000 troops on Ukraine's eastern borders. In addition to the U.S. envoy to the Organization for Security and Cooperation, a European issued a stark warning on Thursday that drumbeat of war is sounding loud, though we are still looking forward for a diplomatic resolution. It's to um, some of the underlying issues related to transparency and deconfliction, that we can get to risk reduction and conflict management so that the overall security situation in Europe is more stable. That is certainly viable if Russia is prepared to engage in a good faith way. If they're not and they choose to further invade Ukraine, then they are going to deal with the costs and consequences that the United States and our allies and partners will impose. Well, the intelligence community has not uh, – made an assessment that the Russians have definitively decided to take a military course of action in Ukraine. So as things stand right now, Russia uh, has uh, the opportunity to come to the table uh, as we go forward to deal with the very real concerns that we've put on the table that Secretary Blinken has laid out publicly and to negotiate in some of these areas that we've just been talking about. If Russia chooses to go a different path, we'll respond accordingly. But basically, we are still at a moment where we believe a path of diplomacy can uh, operate um, in a way that vindicates and reflects our interests and principles, and we're prepared to work with our allies and partners on that. I think we're united with the European Union, with NATO, with uh, Ukraine, with the rest of the countries of the Euro-Atlantic community uh, on the notion that there is a diplomatic path forward here. We are also united with our allies and partners that if Russia chooses to go a different way for whatever reason or no reason at all, well, we'll be ready for that. The US has accused Russia of planning covert operation, including sabotage in eastern Ukraine to create a pretext for invasion after diplomatic efforts to defuse the crisis failed. Hussein Burkan on what follow. The White House has confirmed a report that its intelligence indicates that Russia is planning to use a fake operation to pave the way for a final invasion of Ukraine from mid-January to mid-February. We have information that indicates Russia has already pre-positioned a group of operatives to conduct a false flag operation in eastern Ukraine. The operatives are trained in urban warfare and in using explosives to carry out acts of sabotage against Russia's own proxy forces. Our information also indicates that Russian influence actors are already starting to fabricate Ukrainian provocations in state and social media to justify a Russian intervention and sow divisions in Ukraine. For its part, Pentagon spokesperson John Kirby explained what the purpose of Ukraine's cyber attack could be during a press briefing. You're asking me to speak for uh, the actors responsible for this, but, uh, but one could imagine, right, that a, a, an attack like that is meant to disrupt capability, uh, to, uh, to try to dissuade action, to try to, to uh, change the, the behaviors or the leadership decisions inside Ukraine. I mean, any number of reasons, uh, not to mention just to intimidate. Uh, now, as I understand it, uh, most of these websites are coming back online now. Uh, but, I mean, I think there's probably a m multiple purposes that were 
excuse me, that were sought, sought by, the, by the actors in this case. Meanwhile, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei stated that Russia was not ready to wait forever for the U.S. and NATO to respond to its security demands, and that his government wanted a detailed written response to every Russian proposal. We are waiting for written reaction. We have reasons to believe that our partners have understood the necessity to react quickly, precisely and on paper, and they understood that we are not going to wait forever, but, of course, there are plans to drag it on and on. We want to see their response in writing, article by article and point by point, for both our documents. We want to get their reaction, if this suits them or not, and why, if there is need for addition. Formulate the amendment. Give us the amendment in writing if you have something to add. The Russian President Vladimir Putin was asked directly what can be the response if Russia proposals about security guarantees would be rejected. He literally said that there are many options for responding. It depends on the proposal given to him by our military experts. It's worth recalling that Russia has amassed more than 100,000 troops on its border with Ukraine. Concurrently, Ukraine was hit with a cyber attack Friday warning to be afraid and expect the worst. Just hours after diplomatic talks between Russia and Western states had wrapped up without any major breakthrough. Serbia is to hold a nationwide referendum on charges to the constitution that the government says would strengthen the independence of the country's judiciary. Yet Kosovo lawmakers held an extraordinary session to pass a resolution banning the holding on its territory of referendum being organized in Serbia. Claimed that the opening polling station for Kosovo's ethnic Serb minority to vote in Serb referendum would violate the country's constitution, laws, and international practice. Authorities says 225 people have died in Kazakhstan's violence, which began with non-violent rallies in early January. Sarik, the prosecutor's office head of criminal prosecution, said during a press conference that the bodies of 225 persons were handed to funeral parole and at the state of emergency, 19 of whom were law enforcement officers and military personnel. The president, Kasim Chukayov, declared a state of emergency and requested assistance from Russian-led military alliance in response to unprecedented violence between security forces and anti-government protesters in the energy-rich ex-Soviet state. Migrant camps and shelters in Mexico are running out of space as families continue arriving at their doors. The COVID-19 and let me say the COVID pandemic has brought the U.S. asylum process to a virtual standstill and things are now getting worse after a controversial Trump-era policy was implemented. Zara Virginia on what follow. Mexican migrant camps and shelters are running out of space due to the significant increase in the number of families arriving at their doors. Shelter directors in Tijuana, Mexico, say that both space and food for everyone is limited, which makes it impossible to have more asylum seekers, and they're forced to turn them away. It is very painful to see women and children arriving at our doors asking for shelter. Large arrivals of migrants extending the limits of the services shelter can provide is not a new phenomenon, but the COVID-19 pandemic has made things more complicated. Over a year, the UN International Organization for Migration has been using a hotel in downtown Tijuana as a temporary housing and a quarantine to new arrivals, but it wants the US and Mexico to provide extra help. Those shelters that are able to receive families are overcrowded right now. They're over 100% in capacity. A lot of them have three or four spaces, but the families are still coming. Families say they've been in the migrant camps for more than two months. However, they don't consider returning to their homes in southern Mexico an option from the gang violence and extortion they face. Further complicating manners is the re-implementation of a U.S. policy known as the Migrant Protection Protocol, which forces asylum seekers to return Mexico while their cases are processed. 
With MPP scheduled to be reinstated in more cities along the border, it's feared overcrowded conditions at shelters and migrant camps will only get worse. The renewable energy in Kenya is seeking to a total self-sufficiency by the year of 2030 as it's currently around for 73% of Kenya's installed power generation capacity, while 90% of electricity in use is from green sources among geothermal, wind, solar and hydroelectric installations. Kenya is one of the leaders in renewable energy. With 92.3% of electricity generated locally from renewable sources, hydro, geothermal and wind power, which is three times the percentage of renewables and electricity generation globally, including solar power. The country installed the biggest wind power plant in sub-Sahara Africa, the Lake Turkana Wind Power Project which is steadily exploiting and deploying available geothermal potential, estimated to be 10,000 megawatts. In recent years, the country has made significant process in advancing access to affordable and clean energy. It has increased access to electricity from below 30% in 2013 to over 75% in 2022. In Kenya, renewable energy is one of the key energy subsectors that significantly contribute to overall energy mix. In Africa, Kenya leads in exploiting renewable energy sources to provide energy required to complement the realization of Vision 2013, which aims to a total self-sufficiency in energy. The aim of Kenya is to reduce carbon emissions from the energy sector while ensuring that all people have access to clean energy in which the Renewable Energy Department is responsible for. The department is also responsible for leading the planning, development, implementation, promotion and execution of structures for the development and regulation of renewable energy and energy efficiency through research and planning. According to the Renewables 2018 Global Status Report, Kenya ranks ninth in the world for its geothermal power generating capacity. That's all for today's bulletin. See you tomorrow and have a blessed evening. And not to forget our all prayers with national football team to make it through this evening with a victory and a lot of goal. See you. Bye-bye.